Time for us to do some practice with problems involving arc length, which means we once again go into battle against our nemesis, the square root. Well, oftentimes we'll see that there are ways to deal with the square root as we work through the problems. And of course, we need to work through the problems and we need to do as much as we can. So we encourage you, do as many of the problems as you can by yourself. And if you're following along with the video, make frequent use of the pause button and say, let me see. Let's see what happens when I try it. And pretty soon, you'll be solving these problems like a calculus pro, because you can become a calculus pro. We believe in you. But for now, we should begin. So, our first problem. Find the length of the curve y equals 2 thirds x to the 3 halves, for x going from 3 to 8. Well, hmm, okay. What's our our problem. Well, we know it's a length problem because the clue was the word length. Okay, so we know if it's a length problem, think length formula. So our length formula says that the length is integral a to b, which really means add up of the square root of 1 plus the derivative squared dx. Okay, it's a good formula to memorize. This is a, a nice expression. All right, so in our case, well, a to b, 3 to 8. So 3 to 8, square root of 1 plus, now we need to take the derivative. Well, in our case here, this is our f of x, 2 thirds x to the 3 halves. So the f prime of x would be what? Well, the 3 halves comes down, 2 thirds times 3 halves is 1, x to the one half. Ah, that's kind of nice, especially because we're now going to square it. So, x to the one half squared. And, well, x to the one half squared becomes simply x. So what we really have, we can write the inside, I'll write it in the opposite order of the way it's written now, as x plus one to the one half. Now this is an integral we can actually do. In fact, we don't need to do very much to do it. It's acting like x to the one half. The plus one is inconsequential. Now, if you're not comfortable with what I just said and what we're about to do, you can always do a substitution, u equals x plus one, and uh, follow it from there. But for us, we say, look, this is really acting like something to the one half power, because it's simply x plus a, a constant. That plus a constant is a shift, and uh, so we, we, we're okay, we're okay. So we add one to the exponent, x plus one to the three halves, and then we multiply by two thirds. And we need to evaluate three to eight. So we plug in here eight, eight plus one is nine. We're gonna take that to the three halves power. And uh, well, subtract three plus one is four. We'll take that to the three halves power. Now, 9 to the 3 halves. Well, we all know that 9 cubed is 729, but suppose you're on a desert island and you forgot that 9 cubed is 729. And then you're like, well, what? Because, of course, after you say, hey, what's the square root of 729? And, of course, we can all say it together. 27, right? No, 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 come on. That's not how you do things. What we have is it's really to the 3 halves power says, you're going to do a cube, and you're going to do a half. And you should choose which one to do first. And the goal is, do this operation that makes things smaller first. It's easy to go small, big, then they go big, small. 9 to the half is 3, so it's like 3 cubed. Then you just work your way, 3, 9, 27. So we get 2 thirds, 27. Similar process here, 4 to the 3 halves. Well, square root of 4 is 2. 2 cubed is 8. So 27 minus 8. Well, it takes 27, subtract 8. It's 19. Well, 3 doesn't go into 19. That's all right. It doesn't have to. 2 times 19 gives us 38. And so we end up with 38 thirds. Nice answer. Nice answer. All right. Well, let's hope that we all always get nice answers. We probably won't but we should try our best to enjoy our journeys. So, our next problem. 
Find the length. Aha! This one is a length problem. Well, that'll be a common theme today. Find the length of this function. x equals 1 12th y cubed plus 1 over y for y going from 1 to 4. Well, okay, now this has x as a function of y. You don't have to change any process. It's still the same philosophy. You just have to change what's the variable. In our case, our variable will become y. So what's our length formula? Well, we're adding up, which really means we integrate from somewhere to somewhere. So I use c to d. Then it's, when we have the length, it's the square root of 1 plus the derivative squared. It's really important to remember this square. And uh, in indeed, whenever you're dealing with square roots, square roots are very delicate. And when you have a, a length problem with this uh, set up, either you have to make sure everything's just in place or it's going to fall apart. In some sense, it's kind of a built-in mechanism to see if you're on the right track. Because you got to have an answer if it's, if it's just like on an exam, like, hey, what's this length? We got to get an answer. That means everything somehow has to work out. So you have to start looking for certain nice things to happen. So be careful. Don't forget anything. You know? Don't forget that there's a 1. Don't forget that you're squaring. Don't forget that that's the derivative and not the function. All these little things contribute. So we got to pay attention. Well, of course. Of course we got to pay attention. Okay. So where, of course, in our case, g of y is our function 1 12th y cubed plus 1 over y, which, by the way, you know, this has y to the minus 1. So g prime of y, the derivative, the 3 came down, 3 twelfths, known as 1 fourth, y squared, minus 1 comes down, minus y to the minus 2, because you subtract 1. All right, also known as 1 fourth y squared minus 1 over y squared. Now we come to here, and we say we're ready to go. Our bounds are 1 to 4. So 1 to 4, the square root of 1 plus, and now 1 fourth y squared minus 1 over y squared, all of that squared, dy. All right. Now at this point we're like, huh. Followed by a, huh, what are we looking for? Well, we're looking for a way to integrate this. And so we should start to focus our energy and say, okay, how can I deal with the square root? Look for a square or look for something you can pull out, some kind of substitution. That's the kind of things we tend to look for. But really, we have to say, look, it's not workable in the way it is right now. We've got to simplify. Well, all right, so let's simplify. So what can we do? Well, let's square it. So 1 to 4. Square root of 1 plus, OK. When we multiply this out, we're going to get 1 fourth y squared squared. So that's 1 fourth squared is 1 16th. y squared squared y to the fourth. Now we have the cross term. So if you're thinking like a minus b squared, it's a squared minus 2ab plus b squared. So we're looking for that 2ab. Notice what happens. You have a y squared and a y squared. So when we multiply, the y squareds cancel. And then we have that minus. There's a ab that's 1 and a fourth. And there's a factor of 2. So you put it all together, it becomes minus a half. And then the last term plus 1 over y squared, 1 over y to the fourth. All right. And there we go. There we go. Now, we look at this and say, can we do anything else? And we say, ah, 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 ah. Because what do we see here before our eyes? But a pair of terms that we can combine. The 1 and the minus half. In fact, notice that not only they combine, but they combine together in a beautiful way. And in particular, what we can do is we say, look, they combine together. It changes this minus a half to a plus a half. Just a small, subtle doop, doop. 
but an important change. Why do I say that? Well, let's catch up to where we are. So you have 1 over 16th y to the 4th plus a half plus 1 over y to the 4th. And we stare at this for a second, hopefully not too long, and we say to ourselves, you know, this current piece underneath the square root is really, really close to that. And we know that this came from a square. In fact, the only thing that's different is the plus versus the minus. So the question, can this be a square? And the answer is yes. What's the change? What do we do here? The change is the minus becomes plus. So this problem has been specially rigged so that there's that, there's that half there that comes doop and works out really clean. So this becomes the integral 1 to 4 of the square root of 1 fourth y squared plus 1 over y squared squared. And then we say, ha ha, the square root the square, life is good, things simplify. So 1 up to 4, 1 fourth y squared plus 1 over y squared. Okay, and now we're happy. These are things we can integrate because essentially it's y's to powers. Of course, this term here, 1 over y squared, the way we would do that is we would say, well, look, let's write it in a more calculus-friendly way. And the way you make it more calculus-friendly is you write it as y to a power, so y to the minus 2. And now we're almost there. We integrate here. 1 fourth y squared, well, that would be add 1 to the exponent y cubed divided by 3. So we get 1 12th y cubed. Here, you add 1 to the exponent. Okay, that would be, uh, whoops, that plus should have been a plus. I'm sorry, there we go. Pay attention. Copy errors are terrible, and it's easy to make a copy error. Okay, anyways, add 1 to the exponent, that's minus 1, and you divide, so this becomes a minus y to the minus 1 or 1 over y. And we're going to evaluate from 1 to 4. Amazingly close to the original function. Slight difference, slight difference, but small differences matter. Okay, so finishing up, we plug it in. 4 cubed. Well, that's uh, 64. So we'll just write that as 64 over 12, then minus 1 fourth. Well, since we already have something over 12, 1 fourth is like 3 over 12. Then we'll subtract here, plug in 1. 1 twelfth, well that's pretty straightforward, and minus 1. Now, since everything's in 12, so let's go ahead and make it a 12 twelfths. So, what do we end up with here? 64 minus 3, 61, minus one more, 60, then plus, because there's minus minus, 12 more. That makes 72. And then over 12, this is 72 twelfths. Oh, well that's not such a, a bad number. 72 twelfths, because 12 goes into 72, leaving us with a final answer of Six. And there we go. Well, that wasn't so bad at all. Wow. Beautiful. Beautiful answer. Almost makes you worry when you get an answer that's too nice. But why should we complain? It's nice to get good answers. All right. Well, good. Our next problem. Let R be the region enclosed by f of x equals x squared and g of x equals 4 minus 2x minus x squared. Set up, but do not. Okay, they're like, ah, do not. You know, well, that probably means that we would have a really hard time to actually do it. But we can set things up to find the perimeter. So when we talk about the perimeter, well, meter is a, is a measure, and peri means sort of the edge. So it's the measuring of the edge. Perimeter, that's what's on the length of the edge of your shape. All right, 
Now, notice what we don't have. We do not have any bounds. There's no bounds given on this problem. And so that's kind of different. So we're going to have to think about how to deal with that. So maybe we should start by drawing a picture to get an, a sort of an, a sense of where this problem is going. Well, x squared, that's not so hard to visualize. In fact, uh, we see that all the time. It's, it's the classic parabola. Okay, so we have our x squared, and it looks something more or less like that. And then we have this other curve. 4 minus 2x minus x squared. Now it's not entirely clear what this other curve would do. Uh, I'm not in completely sure, to be honest. But what we know for sure, because we see the minus here, is it's upside down. We know, for instance, it has to cross at, say, 4. Let's just say this is 4. So it's going to be an upside-down parabola that has a y-intercept of 4. So it's going to do something. So, all right, we'll say it does something like this. All right, maybe. Well, we'll see. We could be wrong. We'll find out in a second. So what we see is we see these two parabolas. We want the region enclosed by them, which means that we're really after this shape here. Okay, so that's our region. Now, what are we really after? Well, we're after the perimeter. So, what we want is we're going along the outer edge. And we're asking ourselves the question, what can we say about the length along this outer edge? Well, what we can do is we can really talk about it as two parts. We can say, look, there's a top part that's this parabola, and there's a bottom part that's the parabola. And we can say, find the length of the top part, find the length of the bottom part, add them together, and there you go. That's your length. Great plan. In fact, let's do it. Okay, so what's the only thing we're missing right now? We have our functions, and uh, we'll write them down here for reference. So our, our x squared downstairs and our 4 minus 2x minus x squared upstairs. The really, the big part we're missing is the coordinates. You know, where are the bounds? Where do we start? Where do we stop? Okay, well, to figure that, we say, well, where do the curves intersect? So that would have to be, when does x squared equal 4 minus 2x minus x squared. Well, let's uh, move everything over. And if we do that, what do we get? Well, we'll get 2x squared plus 2x minus 4 equals 0. Or, divide by 2, x squared plus x minus 2 equals 0. And now we ask ourselves the question, does it factor? Well, does it? <laughs> Surprisingly often, Problems here in calculus tend to factor. In the real world, they probably wouldn't factor, but that's okay. We're in calculus, an even better world. So this one does factor. Can you see it? It factors as we need two numbers that multiply together to give negative 2, add together to give positive 1. So 2 and negative 1 are two such numbers, which tells us that actually our picture wasn't so bad. It says, one intersection point is at 1, and the other intersection point is at negative 2, right? Because x minus 1 equals 0, at x equals 1, x plus 2 equals 0, at x equals negative 2. And now we're ready to do our setup. And once we we're got the setup, we're done, because that's all we need to do, is we just have to get things set up. So we say, okay, our length well, let's do the bottom part, is the integral. We go from negative 2 to 1. And then we say the square root of 1 plus, take the derivative of the bottom function. So the derivative of x squared would be 2x squared dx. OK, so that's the length of the bottom. Now you might say, ooh, that does not look pleasant. And you are correct. That is not a pleasant integral. There are ways to do this integral. 
and they involve methods that we're going to talk about in, in a very different session. Uh, you may have heard of something called trigonometric substitution. It's going to be a journey to do it. So this shows you, hey, it's just a parabola. How bad could it be? And the answer is, it can be pretty bad. It can be really, really bad. So that's why terrible functions sometimes have beautiful answers. And nice, simple functions sometimes have terrible answers. You just don't know. You got to do the work. All right, now that's the that's the bottom part. So let's make a note here. This is the bottom. And then, of course, to finish off, we also need the top part. Well, again, we're still going from negative 2 to 1. So, we're, we're you know, there's not like, oh, you have to go this way, and then you have to go that way. No, no, no. Negative 2 to 1. Negative 2 to 1. Square root of 1 plus. Now, take the derivative. So, derivative of 4 is 0, then negative 2, and minus 2x squared, and dx. There is our top. And, again, we're not going to simplify. We could do this by other methods, but that's outside the scope of what we have available to us right now. Really, we just need to set it up. And for that, we have succeeded. This computation, the sum of these two integrals, is the total length all the way around for our region. Good. Nice. Good progress. Good progress. So let's do some more problems. Woohoo! And this one. Ah, this one looks interesting. What a what a curious curve. Find the length of the curve y equals the natural log of x plus the square root of x squared minus 1. And x is going to be, go between 1 and root 5. So this is a, this is a picture of what the curve looks like. And looking at the curve, our initial Reaction is like, oh my gosh, we got to integrate that. <gasps> but remember, we don't have to integrate this. That's the function. There's a process of setting things up. And oftentimes, a really unpleasant looking thing at the beginning is a signal something nice is about to happen. You've got to do a little bit of investing to get to that nice point. But I predict, well, to be honest, I've done this one before. But still, I predict good things will happen to us. Because, you know, we, we've lived a good, clean algebra life. If you live a good, clean algebra life, good things should happen when you're doing calculus. So, what do we have? Well, the length. Okay, we know it's a length problem. It tells it to us. Length. So, we say length is integral a to b, which, of course, means we're adding things up from a to b. Integration is always about adding things together. The square root of 1 plus... And, uh, well, we can write y prime. We can write f prime. We can write y prime. We can write dy, dx. Whatever helps you remember the formula. y prime squared dx. So, what do we need? Well, we need to invest some time in y prime. So, time to begin our, our investment here. Now, natural log. That's actually not so bad to, to do a computation, a derivative with. The way you do a derivative of natural log is you do 1 over the inside, so 1 over x plus square root of x squared minus 1. Then you multiply that by the derivative of the inside. Well, what would that be? The derivative of x is 1, and now, hmm, square root of x squared minus 1. In terms of derivatives, we really would like to think of this as x squared minus 1 to the half. That's, that's how we think of that term. So, plus... The half comes down, x squared minus 1 to the minus 1 half, and then multiply by the derivative of the inside, which is 2x. Let's clean it up. This We have to do something with this derivative. And so if you have to do something with an expression, you should try to say, let's make it look nice. Let's, let's love ourselves enough that we're going to make it simple to work with, and we're going to have a good time working with this expression. There are certain things that do happen. We can spot one right away. See that a half and that two? Well, those are going to cancel. Woohoo! Progress! All right. Well, is there anything else we can say? Let's see. What does this become? So we have 1 over x plus the square root x squared minus 1. 
Now here we have one plus, there's an x upstairs, and this square root really goes downstairs. So that's what we have there. Now we say, hmm, let's go ahead and add these two terms on the inside. So we need to make this one a square root of x squared minus one over a square root of x squared minus one. Okay, all right. So still have that thing on the inside, oh, sorry, in the front. Okay, times square root of x squared minus one plus x over square root of x squared minus one. And now we sort of sit there and go, oh, what can we do? What can we do? What can we do? Do you see anything? I think there's something. Look at what we have. Square root of x squared minus one plus x. x plus the square root of x squared minus one. They're actually the same. We just swapped the order that we're adding things. That doesn't change the value. <gasps> oh, that's nice. So after a little bit of wonderful algebra, we see that our derivative is something very pleasant to work with. One over the square root of x squared minus one. And now we feel like, good, progress, great progress. So let's catch up. Here we go. We have the integral, one to root five. One to root five, square root of one plus y prime, we have it here, 1 over the square root x squared minus 1 squared. And yeah, got to remember, there, what's being squared, what's not being squared, keep track. It matters because the algebra is highly dependent on doing things the right way. But now we're like, ooh, there's a square root and we're squaring it. That's nice. That has a clean thing. So this becomes the integral. 1 to root 5, the square root of 1 plus 1 over x squared minus 1. All right, good. Now, keep doing your algebra. What comes next? We have two terms being added in the square root. Combine them. Add them together. Okay, that's not so bad. So that would be 1 to root 5. It would be the square root of x squared minus 1 over x squared minus 1, and then plus 1 over x squared minus 1. And now we take a look and say, aha, <laughs> the fun continues. Algebra, you beautiful, beautiful thing. Because the minus 1 and the plus 1 cancel. And we can go even further. The square root of x squared, x. It becomes x. Now you might say, Steve, you've made me so paranoid. Square root of x squared, shouldn't it be absolute value of x? Well, it can be, uh, but you have this little thing that says, where is your x at? If you don't know where x is at, you gotta be careful and put absolute value. Look where our x is at. See, we're told x is going from one to root five, which means x is positive. So we are okay just saying x. No need for absolute value here. All right, so we have the integral one, to square root of five, and uh, we have x, that's the top. And I'll go ahead and write this other part as x squared minus one to the minus a half. So that's not terrible. In fact, reasonably speaking, it's, it's almost doable in that we're going to do it. So the question becomes, okay, but, but how? Well, we're not gonna do anything fancy, not gonna pull out some deep machinery, we say, look, it's not one of our basic functions. It's not something we can automatically integrate. That's what we mean when we say it's not one of our basic functions. There's no, no really, we've really pushed algebra about as far as we can. This is about as simple as we can get from an algebraic perspective. But of course, we always have substitution. Ah, our good friend substitution. Boy, I'll tell you, we need to, we need to go out and buy substitution a drink sometimes because they are just such a great friend. You know, they're always there for us always ready to listen to us and lend a hand. What's the substitution we should make here? Do you see? Well, look at our inside part, x squared minus one. The root of that is almost x. 
Well, almost x. What, why do I say it's almost x? So if u equals x squared minus 1, du is 2x dx. And you're like, ah, too bad there's no 2. We have ways to fix that. If there's no 2 there, we put a 2 there. Aha, problem solved. But, but now you're looking at me, no, no, no. <laughs> you've created a problem. Well, but now I just say, look, I just have to fix the 2, and that's easy to fix. So, so constants are easy to fix. That's why we're to say, look, don't worry about the constants. They're not the problems. When things aren't constants, lots of problems. Uh, so now, if you think of it this way, there's other ways to think about it, but this is perfectly fine. 2x dx becomes du. They say, ah, great. So we have, this is the integral. There's a factor of 1 half. 2x dx becomes du. This x squared minus 1 to the minus 1 half u to the minus one half, but we're not done. We've also got to update our bounds. Plug in one. One minus one. Oh, sorry, I'm plugging in the wrong place here. One minus one, zero. Okay, so our bound is zero. Plug in five. Five minus one. What's our bound? Well, it's four. Now, you might worry a little bit about the fact zero is kind of bad here because you have this zero to a negative power. That seems like we shouldn't be doing that. Ooh, that is a great discussion, and we're going to have that discussion another day. But for now, I'll just tell you, we're okay. It's totally cool. We're among friends. We're fine. Now, why is it happening? And the answer is the reason it's happening is you see how we have that slope showing up? Well, this happens to be a place where you have a vertical tangent line, so it's like an infinite slope. Just proceed like you didn't notice it, and if you get an answer, then you're fine. So we're going to proceed like we didn't notice it. Okay, so what's the integral of u to the minus one half? Well, it's u to the one half, right? But what do you need to do then? Well, you need to divide by half. Well, we have a half in front, so if you have a half, and you divide it by a half, the halves cancel out. Well, that's great. So that says the antiderivative is just u to the one half. And now we need to go from zero up to four. Well, square root of zero is zero. Ha, wow, this is great. Square root of four is two. And we're done. That's it. That's it. Wow, what a great answer. When we look at the function originally, we wouldn't think that it would be so clean at the end, and not just that the answer is, is a nice small number, but that the process is a sort of says, okay, be careful. Be careful with your algebra. Be careful with your simplifying. And then things get better and better. Ah, oh, what a great problem. This was a, oh, there's so many great problems in calculus. We are so lucky, so lucky. All right, well, we should do more then. Find the length of y equals the square root of 1 minus x squared, where x goes from 0 to a. All right. Cool. Well, let's uh, figure this out. Okay. So here we go. So what do we have? Well, we have our formula. We can say our length, we know it's a length, is you add up, or in other words, you integrate from start to finish of the square root of 1 plus your dy dx, which you can write this as, or you can put y prime, you can put f, whatever you like, whatever your notation you like, dx. Okay, good. Now, in our case, we're going to go from 0 to a. So, so here, our a and our b are 0 and a. It's kind of a little bit weird that a is on the upper bound, but that's okay, no worries. It's just a choice of notation. We can change notation. We can do it. We're pros at this. We're getting good. All right, now what? Well, the square root of 1 plus, okay, let's take this derivative. Now, the way we take the derivative is we say, hey, there's another way to think about this function. This is another way to say 1 minus x squared to the 1 half power. So when we take the derivative, what happens? The 1 half comes down. All right, no surprise there. 1 minus x squared to the minus 1 half, because we subtract 1 from the exponent, 
And then we say throw in the chain rule. Derivative of 1 minus x squared is minus 2x. Now that's our derivative. Don't forget to square everything. And dx. The half and the 2 cancel. Almost like it was meant to be. Well, maybe. Maybe. What else? Well, when we square, what do we have? We get 0 up to a. Then we get the square root of 1 plus the minus square. The minus goes away because when you square a minus, it's a positive. Okay. The x squared. All right. Now, when you square minus to half power, you get minus 1 power, which means it's downstairs. And so it's 1 minus x squared downstairs. All right. Well, good. If we now put that in, so you get 1 minus x squared plus x squared. Common denominator, adding fractions together. Good stuff. All right. Now what? Well, the minus x squared plus x squared cancel off. Woohoo! Cool. Now, almost there. Almost there. So we end up with the integral 0 to a of dx over the square root 1 minus x squared. Now, I'll tell you at this step, there's sort of, we're going to do two things. And there's really a third option. Third option, there's something called trig substitution, which we're going to talk about. You've heard trig substitution a couple of times. And the reason you're going to hear that whenever you see square roots is trig substitution is a fantastic way to deal with square roots. But that's a, a story for another session. But this particular integral, there's actually, if you're really good at remembering facts and you were paying attention back in Calc 1, we saw a function whose derivative was 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. So if you remember that, then we can actually take this antiderivative. So do you remember a function whose derivative is 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared? And it's OK if you don't. I don't remember it either. And the answer is, it's arc sine. So this is the arc sine function. So arc sine of x, evaluate from 0 to a. All right, I promise we'll do it a second way, and we're going to get the same answer. And well, arc sine of 0 is 0. And so that leaves us with arc sine of a. And we're done. OK, now, here we go. We're going to do everything. No calculus involved. Zero calculus, we're going to get the same answer. Well, I hope we do. If we don't, we're, we're in trouble. OK, let's talk about that curve. The square root of 1 minus x squared. It's not just any curve. It's a really nice curve. In fact, it's a really beautiful curve with a, with a very famous and long-standing tradition. Do you recognize what it is? It's the circle. So what we have here is the following. It's, it's a circle. In fact, it's the unit circle. So radius 1, 1. And we're going to some point A. So what we're after is we are after finding the length of a piece of a circle. So we got to think about how to do that. So here we go. Now, we need a fact. And uh, here's our fun fact. It's the following. It says, you know what? If you call this angle theta, then it's the case, let's put our fun fact down here, that if you have a circle of radius r, and this angle here is theta, then the length, oh, you can't tell that's a theta. It is a theta, I promise. In the commentary, I'll say, definitely theta. This length right here is r times theta. Now, how do we do that? Why is that true? Well. It's true because you can think of it in the following sense. You can say, hey, let's think of it as sort of a ratio. How much of the circle do we take? Well, the, we can think of the theta as compared to the full revolution. So theta over 2 pi, that's sort of what percentage did you sweep out? 
versus our length over the total circumference, 2 pi r. So the, the amount of angle on the inside, the central angle, has to be same as the proportion of the amount of the perimeter that you've traversed. Now multiply both sides by 2 pi r, and you get that the length is r times theta. OK, so that's our fun basic fact. So we say, hey, you know what? If we could just find that angle right there, we'd be done. Because whatever that angle is, that's the arc length. Because r, it's a unit circle, is 1. OK, so we're really close to the end. So we just have to say, well, what's that angle? Well, now we're going to do something a little bit cute and say, well, you know, this angle is the same as this angle. This is also theta. And in this triangle, we know two lengths. The side opposite theta is a, and the hypotenuse is 1, because that's the radius. So we have that sine of theta is opposite over hypotenuse, which is a, which tells us that theta is arc sine of a. But we also know that the angle is equal to the length on the unit circle. And we're done. All geometry, all measurement of angles, a little bit of trig involved, and we got the same answer. So it's kind of cool that we we're able to figure out the same answers. In fact, you can use this argument if you're really careful to show that the antiderivative of square root of 1 minus x squared, or the, you know, the integral of square root of 1 minus x squared, uh, can give you arc sine. It's a different story. We'll, we'll get into it in a different day. But there you go. There you go. All right. Well, I think we have enough time to do one more problem, right? Ha ha. All right. So we'll do a little cool down. Set up an integral to find the length of y equals sine x from 0 to pi. Well, all right, that doesn't sound so bad. So we say our formula, well, length is all about adding up a to b, square root of 1 plus your derivative squared. So we're really adding up. And these, this expression, including the dx, is a small length. So we're adding up lots of small lengths. So in our case, we're going 0 to pi. And the square root of 1 plus, well, got to take the derivative of sine. Derivative of sine is cosine. So 1 plus cosine squared and dx. OK, now what do we do next? We box it because we're done. See, the problem says set up, set up. It's not about carrying out the integral. It's about setting up the integral. Now, why is it not about carrying out the integral? Because don't we love carrying out integrals? Well, we do when it's possible. But this is one where it's not possible. There's no nice antiderivative. Now, we know the theory says there is an antiderivative, but there's not a nice one. So what that means is we have to be satisfied with just saying, well, look, here's an expression that gives us what we want. Now you might say, well, if we can't find an antiderivative, what do we do? Well, there's a good story around that. And what we can do is we can always approximate what we're looking for up to any arbitrary precision. So we can find this answer up to arbitrary precision, but involves lots and lots of small, tiny computations. And that's when we turn to our computers. They love doing lots of small, tiny computations. For us, we love the big ideas. That's what we love. And we love working on problems. Well, thanks for coming in and doing problems today. Hope you come back and do some more another day. And uh, take care. Bye.